Shkarov thruster, first proposed by the physicist Dr. Leonid Shkarov, is a type of megastructure which surrounds a star. It would involve constructing a gargantuan orbital mirror next to a star. In this video, we'll start off by first discussing how such a stellar engine works. The orbital mirror is placed in a position next to a star where it acts as a statite, that is, the star's gravity acting on the mirror is cancelled out by the star's radiation pressure acting on the mirror. According to Newton's second law, the net force exerted on the mirror would be zero, and hence the mirror's acceleration and change in velocity would also be zero. Thus, the mirror could remain stationary and hover above the star's surface without the distance between the mirror and star changing. A satellite which remains stationary relative to a massive body's surface is called a statite. This allows the mirror to stay in a position that is stationary relative to the star's surface. For an isolated star without a giant mirror next to it, starlight is emitted radially in all directions, exerting a net thrust of zero on the star, which means that it will remain stationary. But for a star accompanied by a giant mirror statite that causes some of its radiation to get reflected to collide with the star, this asymmetry results in a net thrust being exerted on the star, giving it a gentle continuous push. This is best understood by analogy. Imagine an archer with a bow and arrow floating in the middle of space. If we identify the archer, bow and arrow as the system, and if this system is initially stationary and not moving, then the total initial momentum of the system is P sub i equals zero. If the archer fires the arrow, and the arrow moves in, say, the positive x direction, then it will have some momentum of, say, mv. But because the system is isolated, the total momentum must stay zero. This means that the archer and bow must move back in space in the minus x direction with a momentum of big M times minus big V, such that mv plus big M times minus big V equals zero. The total momentum P sub f of the system is just the momentum mv of the arrow plus the momentum big M times minus big V of the archer and bow. Thus, P sub F equals MV plus big M times minus big V equals zero equals P sub I, and the momentum of the system is conserved. Now, most people would consider that pretty basic physics. The Shkadov thruster works the same way. Replace the archer and the bow with a star and giant mirror, and replace the arrow with light, which has no mass, but still has momentum, and essentially, the star-mirror-light system would have to obey the same laws of physics as the archer-bow-arrow system. The star-mirror system fires off light in one direction away from the mirror statite, say the positive x direction, and the star and mirror must move away in the opposite direction, say the minus x direction, in order for the total momentum to be conserved. If the remote descendants of humanity are a K2 civilization, they might decide to build a mirror statite above the sun's surface and use the mirror statite as a Shkadov thruster. In order to obtain the vast amount of materials which would be necessary to build a mirror gigantic enough to make a Shkadov thruster, K2 civilizations, or K1 civilizations on their way to becoming K2 civilizations, would need to resort to disassembling and dismantling worlds such as comets, planets, and moons for their resources. They would likely start off by dismantling Mercury for resources, since this world is very rich in the kind of resources which would be necessary for building a giant orbital mirror. Also, since the overwhelming majority of materials in any star system are contained in the star, they would also likely resort to a technique known as starlifting. Starlifting is a technique which was first proposed by the physicist David Criswell. It would involve building an enormous megastructure and Dyson swarm around a star, which would be used to extract materials from that star. By utilizing star lifting and by dismantling worlds, our descendants could acquire the amount of materials necessary to build a Shkadov thruster. 
Since all of the other worlds in our solar system are locked in their orbits by the realm of the Sun's gravity, as the Shkadov thruster and star traverse the enormous distances of interstellar space, all of the planets, moons, asteroids and comets would come with them for the ride without their orbits getting altered. Spaceship Solar System If the shape of the mirror, which is to say the Shkadov thruster, was hemispherical, the solar system would speed up by an additional 20 meters per second and be displaced 0.03 light years from its original position after 1 million years. That's not much, but could still be potentially useful in certain situations. For example, if the Sun made a nearby pass with another star, that star's gravitational field could perturb the orbits of the comets within the Oort cloud, threatening the Earth and civilizations on many adjacent worlds. By using a Shkadov thruster to give a slight nudge to our solar system's path through space, such a catastrophe could be avoided. Roughly 5 billion years from now, the Sun will die, which will make the possibility of life and civilization on the Earth impossible. By star lifting, we could extend the Sun's lifetime and therefore the life of our home planet. But an alternative to this would be to jettison the Sun entirely. Using a Shkadov thruster, we could send our solar system along a trajectory which comes very close to an infant red dwarf star. As our solar system whizzed by, the planet Earth could be gravitationally captured by that star and revolve around a new home star. Of course, 0.03 light years isn't enough to reach another star. But after one billion years, the steady impulse exerted by the sun's radiation upon the mirror would have sped up our solar system to 20 kilometers a second, and by then, we would have covered a distance of 34,000 light years, about one third the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy. By planning many millions, and maybe even close to a billion years in advance before our sun turned into a red giant, which would burn the Earth to a crisp or reduce it to a whirl of atoms, the Earth could find a new home solar system. Red dwarf stars can live for up to 10 trillion years, giving our descendants a source of power for many eons. Five billion years is a very long time. Long before then, if our species does not destroy itself, we will have colonized all of the star systems in the Milky Way galaxy using self-replicating von Neumann probes. These phone-sized nanoships would have miniaturized 3D printers which can excavate resources from other worlds and use them to 3D print factories which are capable of making more nanoships which in turn can 3D print more factories and so on. Assuming that these probes travelled at speeds in between light speed and 10% of light speed, we would eventually colonise the Milky Way galaxy in about 100,000 to 1 million years. We could at long last, in locution of Carl Sagan, sail across the starry archipelagos of the vast Milky Way galaxy. This strategy of self-replicating von Neumann probes hopping from world to world is, according to the theoretical physicist Dr. Michio Kaku, the most likely way that our descendants will colonize the Milky Way galaxy and transition to a K3 civilization. It would be theoretically possible for such beings to build Shkadov thrusters in all 400 billion or so star systems in the Milky Way and move the entire Milky Way galaxy across the vast darkness of intergalactic space. After eons have passed, dark energy will have pushed all of the other galaxies so far apart that according to Hubble's law, all but the nearest galaxies will be receding away from each other faster than the speed of light. If our descendants become a K3 civilization and were confined to the Milky Way, after roughly 5 billion years, all of the other galaxies in the universe would be moving away from them and the Milky Way faster than the speed of light. This means that such galaxies will become impossible to detect and visit, assuming that our descendants are unable to develop faster-than-light or FTL spacecraft. For the remainder of the universe's life, they would be stuck with the resources and energy of a single, lonely galaxy. But if our descendants colonized not just all of the star systems in their own home galaxy, but also all of the star systems in other galaxies not too far away from their own, they could move all of those galaxies towards one another until, eventually, they all collided and merged into a single supergalaxy. 
By merging together galaxies early enough, long before 5 billion years from now, and long before they begin receding away from us faster than the speed of light due to the expanding universe, they could extend the amount of energy and resources available to their civilization, and they would, therefore, also be able to extend the lifetime of their species. In other words, by spreading to other galaxies and merging those galaxies together, they could extend the lifetime of their species. Thus, the motive for such beings to spread to other galaxies would be essentially identical to those of their hunter-gatherer ancestors who meandered across the planet Earth, or to the first humans who emancipated beyond the Earth, staying alive. As was well understood by the astronomer and astrophysicist Carl Sagan, and as he explained in his book Pale Blue Dot, by spreading more and more outward, we insulate ourselves from catastrophe and better the likelihood of our long-term survival. If you enjoyed this video, then please visit us on Patreon by clicking the link below and help support our projects. Also, you can keep up to date with the most recent news and updates on Greg School by following us on Facebook or Twitter. See the links down below. We greatly appreciate all of your help and support, and in the next video in our Megastructure series, we'll examine star lifting. Until then, See you next time.